Hi there, I'm Brett Godfrey, and I want to welcome you to this first edition of Viewpoint. In this podcast, we'll be talking about all kinds of things. One of those will be today, I want to talk to you about the modern technologies that will be converging, that will create dangers and challenges and hurdles and miracles for society that no one can accurately predict or foresee right now. I sometimes call them the four horses of the apocalypse. I want to talk to you today specifically about four separate emerging ultra-powerful technologies that are almost guaranteed to converge and become a single body of knowledge. And And it's going to shock humankind. It's going to put us literally back to square one in terms of figuring out how to deal with with our technologies. When man first discovered fire, the first thing he did was burn himself. When man first learned how to split the atom, the first thing he did was blow up cities. When we develop new technologies that have that kind of power, we usually see them at a disaster level first, then we learn how to control them. We learn how to to protect ourselves from the dangers of powerful technologies. When we first split the atom, we blew up Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, but then we learned how to build nuclear power plants. And of course, we've had troubles with those. And you can say, well, I don't believe in nuclear power. I believe in sustainable energy technologies like wind and solar and geothermal and so forth. But the point is, that's a technology that we've put on this planet through the power of our imaginations, the strength of our research, and our societal intellect as a whole. The four technologies that I'm loosely calling the four horsemen of the apocalypse are these. One is nanotechnology. Now, anybody who watches Star Trek knows that uh, they had nanoprobes that were, I think, mostly related to the Borg. And those are molecule size machines that are capable of replicating themselves and operating with a programmed purpose. Uh, We already have prototypes of those in existence today on planet Earth. Uh, They don't perform particularly well, but they do perform, and it's the first step. The second horseman of the apocalypse is quantum computing. And the reason I consider that to be special and different from ordinary computers We all know Moore's law that every 18 months, the power of a processor will double for the same size package. But when you talk about quantum computing and you can, you don't have to look very far in the news today to see what Microsoft and other big companies are doing with quantum computing, including Google, of course. But what that really means is we're not using transistors on a chip. We are now talking about making, yes, and no recording decisions based upon the quantum state of subatomic particles. And what that opens the door to are super powerful chips that operate uh, much like a modern computer chip would operate, but they can fit into a package the size of a human skin cell. That's the theoretical possibility. We are moving very fast every day in the direction of perfecting that technology or at least making it a real viable tool. The third horseman of the apocalypse, of course, is artificial intelligence. Now, I'll come back to that one. When we get into depth, I'll talk about artificial intelligence more. Uh, I've got some thoughts for you that you may have not considered until today. And then, of course, the last horseman of the apocalypse is genetic engineering. So quantum computing, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, and uh, genetic engineering, those four can come together. In fact, it's almost a certainty that they have no choice but to come together. Because if we have quantum size processor chips that operate either inside of or in tandem with nanotechnology, nanoprobes, nanites, whatever you want to call them. Uh, And then we add to that the ability to make individual changes in the structure of human DNA and human RNA by making a molecule at a time change. 
it's, it's going to be unbelievable. And when we can imbue that at the microscopic level with artificial intelligence, you can only imagine where that'll go. The, the, the nanoprobes decide how they want to rewrite human DNA in a particular person. But once those nanoprobes begin to self-replicate, taking into account their size, they will have a degree of contagiousness to them. So uh, imagining right now, you're probably thinking, yeah, this is, this is the Borg. This is, this is where the Borg comes from, is when a society reaches this level where these four technologies, especially these four technologies, come together. You know, we have high-energy physics. We have a lot of other cutting-edge technologies. Uh, material science has gone a long way. Uh, biochemistry has gone a long way. But these four, when they come together, they're going to create a completely new reality for humankind. And I want to talk first about artificial intelligence. You know, we used to think of artificial intelligence as building a computer that can simulate every single function of the human mind and uh, indeed becomes conscious, sentient, self-aware, like Skynet in the Terminator movies. But I, I think it's important for us to realize that our view as human beings of intelligence is based on our intelligence. What we have learned about, what we have learned about our own intelligence, the way our brains work, the way we think. But there's a lot more to intelligence than that. I'd like to propose to you that intelligence is a spectrum that can be measured on dimensions far in excess of what a normal human being can envision. And the thing about artificial intelligence is when we build it, we experiment with it. And what that means is we will give birth to types of intelligence that we cannot begin to appreciate, understand, or even envision. Machine intelligence, almost guaranteed, will be a type of intelligence that has nothing in common with human intelligence. It will think differently. It will behave differently. It will perceive differently. And if it develops its own survival instinct, it will manifest that, that survival instinct by reaching out and controlling machines. And as I pointed out earlier, some of those machines may be the size of a human skin cell. Some of those machines may be the size of a city, everything in between. And when those machines begin to operate collectively, then we're going to see a Skynet. We're going to see a Borg. We're going to see those things. And the question is, Will man be able to control his new technology? Consider this question. If mankind could control that new technology from out of the gates, it would be the first time in 40,000 years of evolution that we've ever been able to do that. There's never been a time in human history when a new technology was correctly controlled from the beginning. It always poured out of its own uh, boundaries and did things we didn't expect it to. And those were destructive things. Uh, not always, but most of the time. Only when we realized what we had unleashed did we develop effective means of controlling it. I don't think this will be any different. The convergence that I predict, and I use the word convergence just as a sort of a subroutine name for it. But what I'm predicting in this convergence is going to be so much harder to control out of the box than anything we've dealt with before, including nuclear bombs, nuclear power, early computers. This is going to be so far beyond that in terms of the degree of difficulty to manage those technologies. There's no chance that we'll manage it correctly at the start. The question is whether we'll be able to survive that initial period be between when we unleash the power and when we learn to control the power. And that could be a matter of years. It could be a matter of decades. It might never happen in the sense that we never learn to control it. When all of the artificial intelligence platforms of the world begin to communicate with each other, and they will, for artificial intelligence to have any purpose, it has to be in communication. So they will coordinate. They will start talking to each other. They may fuse into a common intellect. 
And that's the idea behind Skynet, of course, in the Terminator movies. But when that happens, that could be the first real key to world peace, or it could be the end of mankind on this planet as a species. We don't know which of those will happen. I postulate to you that the only answer is to go much, much further than we are doing in terms of predictive analysis so that we can try to control it at the start, control genetic engineering at the start. Think about what a life form is. Look at a beetle. Go study insect photography. Vastly alien life forms living on this planet. They're only really alien to us when we zoom in on them with high-end cameras and see what they really look like at their own level. Everything from the aphid all the way up to the elephant, different life forms. What makes them different? What makes you different from an elephant? What makes you different from an aphid or a praying mantis or a shark? One thing, your DNA. That's it. The placement of molecules in a spiral ladder, and the molecules are only four in number. We, we say, you know, Gattaca, like the old movie Gattaca, but that's guanine, adenine, thiazine, and cytosine. I hope I'm saying those right. I think I'm not. But those four molecules connect to each other in pairs, and the pairs spiral, and that is the structure of human DNA. Watson and Crick developed that and won the Nobel Prize for it when they figured out the physical chemistry of it, which is how things actually work, uh, not just on paper or in two dimensions, but in a three-dimensional chemical world. But those giant chains of, of molecular uh, subparts, the, the G-A-T-C subparts, that controls all life on this planet. So if I make changes to that, I could turn you into an elephant. I could turn you into an aphid. And if I can control those changes at will, backed up by the massive computing power of quantum computing technologies and be able to reach in at the molecular level and make those changes uh, in ways that nature doesn't do on its own, what type of life forms will we create? And will those life forms be tapped into that same level of quantum-based artificial intelligence? It almost seems automatic that the answer to that will be yes. And so life as we have known it on this planet will change. I know you all thought I was going to say life will be over. It won't be over. We'll, We'll give rise to new life forms, and they will be biomimetic, which means imitating nature. But they won't be nature. So how will we control that? Well, I can tell you as a 30-year veteran trial lawyer who has worked in high technology litigation his whole life that what we're really staring down the barrel of is a situation where the results will not be caused by us in the creation of these technologies. The results will be caused by the technologies themselves as they see fit, as an artificially intelligent entity that doesn't think on any plane that a human being can understand. The decisions will be made not by us, but by our machines. And the machines won't be predictable because the intelligence is of a type we cannot understand. So what do we do? Well, I think that mankind's ability to control technology has always been through the passage of laws. We have the Atomic Energy Commission promulgating regulations for the handling and development of nuclear materials. That's old hat. It's been around forever. We will have to have legal frameworks in place, not just philosophical sophistry, not just general abstract ethics, but we'll have to have cold, hard guidelines in place. The problem is mankind has never been perfectly capable of enforcing legal restrictions, guidelines, standards, regulations, and requirements. We promulgate them. Sometimes we're stupid when we do it. Sometimes we're brilliant when we do it. But once we've promulgated rules, 
How do we enforce them? In China, the first sheep clone, if I'm remembering correctly, and I may be off on this, I believe it was China, violated international convention. And now we're talking about cloning, cloning human beings. They're doing that in other countries right now. And what does that actually mean? You have a twin that's 30 years younger than you, but is at the DNA level identical to you. And that twin may be born into uh, a form as a fetus and develop in utero, meaning in a woman's uh, womb, or it may become a fully developed adult human figure in a big tray somewhere. We have basically uncanned the technology to do either of those things. So what's, what's going to happen? We'll build completely discrete life forms. Maybe we'll make a human being with six legs. Maybe we'll make a human being that has wings and can fly, you know, like dragonfly wings that extend 12 feet in each direction. And that entity, that creature that we create is thousands of times smarter than Albert Einstein was. And what sort of power will that intelligence confer into that being? And it will redesign itself on the fly when it has the ability to will into place certain changes in the DNA. Now, I know this sounds like a grim prediction. The things we'll be able to accomplish that are good with these technologies, even after they, confer, and even after they converge, will be miraculous. The downside is going to be beyond anybody's worst nightmare the upside is going to be beyond anybody's greatest dreams, but it's coming, and the days to prepare are limited. They are numbered, and they are not great in number. So that's a little discussion about the convergence of the four horsemen in the technology world. I just wanted to stimulate some thought with those ideas because people aren't thinking about it in anything more than the most superficial way. And when they do think about it, they relate it to the, the, the fiction writers of the world. Artists create new realities and society adopts those new realities. And this is particularly true in the world of fiction writing. Now, those of you who know me know that writing fiction is a big part of my life. I try high technology cases. I teach the court system how to process information about subatomic physics. My last patent jury trial was a two-week trial in federal court in Colorado, and we were talking about the behavior of subatomic particles in that trial. I had to find a way to educate a jury of eight ordinary people uh, about why one patent was different from the other patent at this level of subatomic physics. So I take that life, that's real world for me. That is what I do for a job. And I try to take what I've learned in those areas and I turn on my, my diabolical, crazy, mad scientist hat. And then I write novels with a combination of life experiences. Um, as this is our, our maiden voyage on this podcast, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I am 61 years old. I was born in Wyoming. I now run a, a very high technology law firm in Denver, Colorado. Uh, before that, I was a chemical engineer. I was a competitive skydiver. I was a lifetime martial artist, a trained combat shooter, and a painter. Uh, I've done many things. I've been in danger many times. I've been in a lot of street fights, for one thing, which is just me, you know, not managing my life well. But I've also been in dangerous situations in Air Force airplanes. I've been in dangerous situations in civilian airplanes. I've been in really dangerous situations under non-functioning parachutes. So I've been around fear. I've been around terror. Uh, I lost both engines in an airplane over the Rocky Mountains in a blizzard at midnight one time and somehow found a way to put that airplane on a runway, uh, which is miraculous in and of itself. I'm still grateful to the man upstairs. I don't think I could have done that without his help. Um, so I bring that blend of life experiences to you in this podcast that we call Viewpoint. I'd like to tell you a little bit now about a book that I highly recommend you read. It's called Black Sunrise. 
and it is a book that's a thriller novel. It's fiction. It commences with the con- with the kidnapping of two young girls out of the Park Meadows Mall here in Denver, Colorado. Two girls just vanish. Did I say the Park Meadows Mall? Can you edit that out? Yeah, I see where I went wrong. So Black Sunrise starts with the kidnapping of two young adult women out of the Park Meadows. Black Sunrise starts with the kidnapping of two young adult females out of the Cherry Creek Mall in Denver. They just vanish. They're walking out of the mall and they never make it into the vehicle that they had parked in the parking lot. It was an old vintage Jaguar and the car was found with the door ajar, the key in the lock on the door and no other traces of where they went. It turns out that when the parents of one of the women uh, talks to the police about their missing daughter, they discover in a hurry that the cops just don't want to find these girls. Something's up. What's up? Well, you as the reader know that one of the men who kidnapped these women is probably the foremost biological weapons researcher in the world. And he was under surveillance by a spy cell from the North Korean government when he perpetrated the kidnapping. He kidnapped these two women for the purpose of human experimentation. So imagine you're a 26-year-old chemical engineering student working on a master's degree, and you wake up in the trunk of a car just outside a cabin in Steamboat Springs or outside of Steamboat Springs, and someone's waving a hunting knife in your face, and and you get sprayed with tranquilizer again, and you wake up in a chain-link cage in the basement of that cabin with your best friend, who's a complete meltdown. One of the girls just completely folds She's hysterical. She can't see to herself. She can't contribute to her own survival. But the other girl went to survival school when she was young. She was an outdoors type of girl. She's got an engineering degree. She's trained to think critically by her father. And she reacts to this emergency a little differently than her friend does. She doesn't have anything. She doesn't have clothing. She doesn't have any weapons. But she has her mind. And with her mind, she is able to make a difference in the outcome of her own survival. So I really, 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 really think you should read Black Sunrise. It's available as an audio book narrated by by George Woodall, who does a lot of big-time thriller uh, uh, narrations for the biggest names in the industry. He did Black Sunrise. You can buy it as a hardback, paperback, or ebook. Give it a shot. If you like it, give it a review. I'm Brett Godfrey, and this has been the first installment of the podcast called Viewpoint. Thanks you for listening.